the first topic is for us to understand about let me show the title of the first topic the title of the first topic is little horn antichrist and this is described in daniel chapter 7 who is this little horn antichrist the reason why we are starting with daniel is there are a lot of similarities between daniel and revelation there are plenty of similarities between daniel and revelation and before we try to unlock these revelation related topics we need to understand how to under how to know the interpretations for these revelations there are plenty of verses there are promises available for us to understand these prophecies and unlock the revelation let's take a look at matthew 11:25 sister if you can please matthew 11:25 at that time jesus answered and said i thank you father Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Jesus always reveals them to the babes. And if you are humble enough to accept that I am a babe, I do not know anything, Jesus is good enough to reveal these to babes. So that's the first promise. Having a humble attitude is the key to understand Revelation or any other Bible, Bible prophecies. Let's go to the next verse. Matthew 13 verses 11 and 12 sister if you can please he answered and said to them because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it has not been given for whoever has to him more will be given and he will have abundance but whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him Jesus talks about two different groups here whoever has and whoever does not have there are two different groups of people and what do we have what do we do not have we need to have a humble attitude we need to use our talent the person who is not using the talent it will be plucked from him and given to the person who has five talents or ten talents so we need to have the talents we need to use those talents we need to have a humble attitude that's the key here for us to understand revelation let's take a look at this verse Ephesians 1 17 let me read this Ephesians 1 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. There is something called as a spirit of wisdom. There is a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And if we have the spirit of wisdom and revelation, we can easily understand the book of Revelation. And uh, Galatians 1.12, if you can read it, Galatians 1.12. Someone can read it, please. Galatians 1 12. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul is talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ, and this is what you'll see in the first verse of Revelation. Revelation 1 1. You'll see the same phrase, revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not just Apostle John alone, even Apostle Paul had the revelation of Jesus Christ and we can also have it with the grace of God. If we have a humble attitude and if we say that uh, I am a babe, I do not know anything, I am a dumb person, if you are humble enough to accept it, Jesus will unlock revelation for anyone. Let's also take a look at a few Old Testament verses. Whether there are promises in the Old Testament to understand the secret things which are from God. Let's read Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The secret things belong to our Lord God. And you need to take a look at this word revealed. Jesus reveals this to certain people. He reveals this to the people who call unto him, who ask him, who say that, I am a babe, I have a humble attitude. And if we can show this through the obedience in Jesus, we'll be able to easily understand the secret things in Bible. Uh, let's find out uh, the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, it says, it is a sealed book. Let's take a look at Daniel 12.4. That's why we are having an emphasis on uh, the book of Daniel, because it has got similarities to Revelation, and it also says that it is a sealed book. Let's read Daniel 12.4. Daniel 12.4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Daniel is a seal book. That's one thing we need to note. And until the time of the end, no one can understand Daniel. 
and if you are able to talk about daniel and if you are able to reveal things in daniel it means that we are living in end times we are living in end times because we are talking about daniel and we have unlocked the prophecies of daniel with the help of the holy spirit and let's find out what daniel says when he understood uh, nebuchadnezzar's dream daniel 222 let's read this he reveals deep and secret things he knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him it is jesus who reveals the deep and secret things it is jesus who reveals the deep and secret things as long as we obey him and we call unto him let's read daniel 228 but there is a god in heaven who reveals secrets there is a god in heaven who reveals secrets and that's jesus so he always reveals secrets and how do we get the secret things from god the answer is there in jeremiah 33:3 let's read jeremiah 33:3 call to me and i will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know amen jesus says call to me we need to call to him we need to ask him to reveal the deep and secret things so now let's look at uh, the books of revelation and daniel let's look at the similarities between these books this table it quickly summarizes the similarities between the two books both books are the 27th books in the each testament daniel is the 27th book in the old testament and revelation is the 27th book in the new testament let's look at the second point both are end time prophecy books are we really saying that daniel is an end time prophecy book we just read daniel 12:4 Let me read that verse for you again. Daniel 12:4. But you Daniel shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Until the time of the end. It's an end time book. It's an end time prophecy book. And we need not say that Revelation is an end time book. Revelation is always an end time book. And in both the books we can see a beast coming out of the sea. Both the books there is a beast that is coming out of the sea. in both the books there is a beast which has 10 horns that is why we are first taking a look at daniel and then we'll move on to revelation prophecies and in both the books daniel as well as in revelation there is a beast which blasphemes it also persecutes the saints it blasphemes the god of heaven it persecutes the saints of jesus and in both the books jesus destroys the beast if you look at daniel 7:11 the beast is destroyed and if you look at the uh, revelation 19:20 the beast is destroyed by jesus during the second coming and both the books are sealed books we just now read it in uh, daniel 12:4 it's a sealed book we also have seven seals in revelation seven seals in revelation jesus unlocks these seals jesus breaks these seals this is something we are going to look at in tomorrow's session and in both the books there is antichrist description good amount of antichrist description in daniel 7 chapter Daniel 11 chapter and uh, there is plenty of antichrist descriptions in Revelation chapter 12 chapter 13 chapter 17 18 and in both the books we need to understand it using the historical fulfillment what is meant by a historical fulfillment so we know that there is a king called as Nebuchadnezzar there is a king called as Cyrus and we also have the same thing in history even if you read a secular history you'll find a king called as Nebuchadnezzar you'll find a king called as king Cyrus uh, Alexander the Great is mentioned in the bible and you'll also find alexander the great in secular history we can easily understand these books revelation and daniel even using secular history the historical fulfillment and both the books one more important point for us to understand these books is it's organized into two equal parts there are 12 chapters in daniel the first six chapters are the main prophecies the main prophecies the dreams the visions there are the first six chapters and the next six chapters it will add something more to it the first six chapters if you can compare the second chapter of daniel and the seventh chapter of daniel there are two different dreams to two different persons first dream to nebuchadnezzar second dream to daniel but both the dreams are almost similar dreams and if you look at revelation the primary prophecy is the first 11 chapters chapters 1 to 11 is the primary prophecy and chapters 12 to 22 is something more to the existing prophecy it's almost similar to daniel it's organized into two equal parts both the books and in both the books it says that the beast persecutes the saints for about 1260 days you have this number in daniel 725 
Daniel 7.25, it says a time times and half a time. And the same is true with Revelation. Revelation 13.5, it says 1260 days or 42 months. The beast will persecute the saints and it is not only persecuting the saints, it is also overcoming, overpowering the saints and killing the saints. And you have seen that there are plenty of similarities and that's why we are starting with Daniel now. So let's start with our first top topic, Little Horn Antichrist. We need to understand the little horn that is described in Daniel chapter 7. And uh, before we go to Daniel chapter 7, we need to understand the dream which God gave to King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. We need to understand the dream of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. He is the king of Babylon. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the first verse, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Let's read Daniel 2.1. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. He had a terrible dream. But what did he see in the dream? He saw a great image. That's what verse number 31 says. If you look at verse number 31, You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. There was a great image that was standing in the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. He was terrified with it. But what was the description about this image? How this image was looking like? Let's have a look at the description about this image. The description is there in verse number 32 and 33. Let's read this verse. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its leg, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. There are four metals in this great image. The head is of gold and it also says that its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron. But what is the meaning for these metals? What's the meaning for the gold? What's the meaning for the silver? What's the meaning for the bronze and iron? And let's try to unlock the meaning from this chapter itself. This is how the picture looks like the great image and it talks about four separate kingdoms. But before we go into the meaning of these uh, metals, Let's also understand what happens to this great image. Let's read Daniel 2, 34 and 35, both the verses. He watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together, and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. A stone which was cut out without hands, it came from heaven and uh, it dashed on this great image and the image was broken into pieces. There was no place found for this great image. And what is this stone? It is the kingdom of heaven. And you can see this great mountain. What is a mountain in Bible? A mountain in Bible is always referring to a kingdom. It's the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, it breaks all the earthly kingdoms. It, all, it breaks all the earthly kingdoms. Now let's take a look at uh, the meanings of these metals. The four metals, it represents four kingdoms. Again, scripture is reference to scripture. We need to unlock scripture with scripture, not with uh, news articles. So let's try to unlock uh, the meanings of these metals. Daniel 2.38, while interpreting the dream, Daniel tells the king of Babylon that you are this head of gold. Verse number 38, you are this head of gold. You in the sense Nebuchadnezzar who is the king of Babylon. You are the head of gold. So gold represents the kingdom of Babylon. It is a kingdom. Each metal is a separate kingdom. Gold is the kingdom of Babylon. Let's look at the other kingdoms. 239, let's read 239 and 40. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. You're seeing this keyword kingdom four times in these two verses, isn't it? There is this keyword kingdom. So what is the meaning of kingdom? Kingdom is represented by these metals. Each metal is a separate kingdom. But we know the, the golden kingdom. Golden kingdom is Babylonian kingdom. But what are the other kingdoms now? Let's look at the references for these kingdoms. Gold represents the kingdom of Babylon. 
silver represents the kingdom of medo persia and you have reference verses mentioned here daniel 239 daniel 75 daniel 820 daniel 526 to 31 these are the reference verses to identify the kingdoms silver represents medo persia what is the third one bronze bronze represents greece and who is the first king of greece it is alexander the great and uh, he is mentioned as a great horn he is mentioned as a great horn in the book of daniel the third kingdom is bronze which is the kingdom of greece and there is a fourth kingdom which is the iron kingdom and this is the roman kingdom the roman empire is the fourth kingdom let's have a look at the verses again to unlock these kingdom names daniel 238 daniel says that you are this head of gold the babylonian kingdom is the first kingdom the golden kingdom let's look at daniel 820 and 21 let's read these two verses the ram which you saw having the two horns they are the kings of media and persia let's read the next verse as well and the male goat is the kingdom of greece the large horn that is between its eyes is the first king daniel 820 you can see the kingdom name media and persia what is media and persia it is today's iran iran's name was persia 50 years back we used to call it as persia and what is the first kingdom babylon babylon is nothing but iraq babylon is iraq and persia is iran and the third kingdom you can see 821 daniel 821 third kingdom is the kingdom of greece and it talks about the first king who is the first king of the kingdom of uh, greece it is alexander the great and he's talked about in detail in daniel chapter 8 what about the fourth kingdom the fourth kingdom it existed during jesus time when was the kingdom of heaven established on earth it was when jesus was born who was there while jesus was born it was the roman kingdom let's read luke 21 and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from caesar augustus that all the world should be taxed caesar augustus caesar was one king in the entire roman empire what is the roman empire it is today's europe today's europe is the roman empire and later it broke down into 10 different kingdoms one kingdom is england one kingdom is spain one kingdom is italy one kingdom is france there is germany there are 10 different kingdoms it, it broke down into 10 different kingdoms at a later point of time but initially during jesus times it was a unified kingdom it was a unified kingdom the fourth kingdom the iron kingdom is this roman empire and D- daniel has a similar dream in daniel chapter 7 daniel has a similar dream let's read these verses daniel chapter 7 verses 3 4 5 and 6 and four great beasts came up from the sea each different from the other the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings i watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it and suddenly another beast a second like a bear it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth and they said thus to it arise devour much flesh after this i looked and there was another like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it there we saw four different metals in nebuchadnezzar's dream here in daniel's dream we see four different beasts what are the names of the beast the first is a lion the second one is a bear the third one is a leopard and the fourth one he couldn't name it but apostle john names it as a dragon he simply says that it's a terrible beast but apostle john has that exact name it's called as a dragon and that's there in our revelation 12 let's look at uh, the description of the fourth beast the fourth beast is the one that we are trying to concentrate on let's look at the fourth beast let's read daniel 7 7 after this i saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast dreadful and terrible exceedingly strong it had huge iron teeth it was devouring breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet It was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. The fourth beast there was no name given to it it simply called as a dreadful and a terrible beast. And the similar description we find it in uh, Revelation chapter 12 as well as in Revelation chapter 13. There is a difference between these two beasts we'll 
later have a look at uh, Revelation 12 and 13. And this fourth beast, we need to understand what is the meaning of each and every beast. Each and every metal, how did we interpret the metals? We interpreted the metals as separate kingdoms. Even the beast is representation of a kingdom. Let's have a look at this verse, Daniel 7.23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. So what is the meaning of a beast? It's there in this verse. A beast means it's a kingdom. If you go looking for a ten-horned beast, it's a never-ending story, you will not be able to find out such a beast. A beast always represents a kingdom, whether it is the book of Daniel or it is the book of Revelation. In both the books, a beast, it means that it is a kingdom. Again, let's have a summary of uh, the four different beasts. This table gives you the reference verses along with the comparison of Daniel 2nd chapter and Daniel 7th chapter. The beasts, lion, bear, leopard, and the fourth one is the terrible beast. And the comparisons in Daniel's second chapter is the corresponding metals would be gold, silver, bronze and iron. And which kingdoms are being represented here? There are four kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. These are the four kingdoms. Both the dreams are similar dreams. That's why I was saying that Daniel is, uh, you'll have two different equal parts in Daniel. First chapter till sixth chapter, there is a primary prophecy. And seventh chapter to twelfth chapter, there is an extra prophecy, there is some addition to it. What are the additions Daniel's dream is having with respect to Nebuchadnezzar's dream? The additions is, here we see ten different horns. And there is eleventh horn which we are going to talk about. And that's the main thing in this particular topic. The eleventh horn which is called as the little horn. Now let's move on to the Antichrist description. There is, after the ten horns, eleventh horn comes up. It's called as a little horn. And uh, there are terrible descriptions about this little horn. This little horn, it blasphemes the God of heaven. It blasphemes Jesus. It also persecutes the saints of God. It persecutes for about 1260 days. Let's read through this Antichrist descriptions. Let's go through Daniel verses, chapter 7, verse number 8, 11, 24 and 25. Let's read these four verses. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched then, because of the sound of the pompous words, which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. The ten horns are ten kings, who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, and times and a half time. What is this little horn doing? First of all, he blasphemes the God of heaven. He persecutes the saints of God. He also subdues three other horns. So what is the meaning of a horn? You can take a look at Daniel chapter 7 verse number 24. It says the ten horns are ten kings. If you go looking for a horn, you will not be able to interpret what a horn is. A horn in Bible prophecy, in these two books, Revelation and Daniel, a horn means it's a king. Earlier we saw that uh, a beast means it's a kingdom. A beast means it's a kingdom, a horn means it is a king. A king always has a kingdom, isn't it? So a little horn means he has a little kingdom. There are plenty of clues given by Jesus to identify who the Antichrist is. And right now, we're going to start with a bunch of points. With a bunch of points, there are plenty of clues given by the Holy Spirit in, these cha in this particular chapter. And we're going to look at it uh, point by point and identify who is the Antichrist. We'll be looking at 10 different points now. Let's look at the first point. The first point, Daniel 7, 8 says, we had already read this verse, Daniel 7, 8 says, it's a little horn. It's a little horn. We saw that a horn means it is a king. A little horn means it's a little king. A little king always has a little kingdom, isn't it? A little king always has a little kingdom. And if we post a general knowledge questions, which is the smallest country in the world? Okay. If you Google it, anyone can easily find it. 
it is vatican city this is the smallest country in the world it's just 110 acres it is just 110 acres and it's lesser than the area in which you are living in and why is it created as a separate country the reason is diplomatic immunity and who is the head of vatican city it is the roman catholic leader the pope the roman catholic leader whom they call as the pope pope is the leader and he is a little horn as per this particular description it's not just one point we have scores of points to prove that pope is the antichrist and uh, whoever is joining the pope even the ecumenical protestant churches they also represent the anti-christian kingdom let's go through the other descriptions you can see this area here this is a very small tiny area 110 acres a small parcel of land which was created as a separate country in 1929 if you want to understand uh, who gave this land to the pope it was a dictator in 1929 benito mussolini 1929 benito mussolini he was a dictator you could have read about him in second world war and he was a dictator he gave this parcel of land to the pope there was a treaty called as a lateran treaty which was signed on february 11th 1929 and that's how the papacy got this particular country the smallest country the little horn is vatican city and we'll go through the other points to prove this and daniel 7 8 this is the second point it says the little horn came up among them daniel 7 8 if you look at the highlighted portion the highlighted phrase it says among them where is the little horn where is the little kingdom it will be among the 10 horns what are the 10 horns the 10 horns are the 10 countries in the roman kingdom the roman kingdom was a unified kingdom initially during jesus days it was a unified kingdom and there was one king who was called as caesar caesar augustus caesar julius caesar there are plenty of caesars available and in 476 ad it got broken down into 10 countries or 10 10 different kingdoms the year is 476 the last caesar his name is called as romulus augustulus Romulus Augustulus was the last Caesar and entire Europe it got broken down into 10 different countries what are the names of the 10 countries one is England one is Spain the other one is Portugal there is France there is Germany there is Italy there are plenty of countries in the western european portion and where this horn has to be if you're trying to identify this kingdom the small kingdom in USA if you're trying to identify the small kingdom in India or China or Australia you will not be able to identify the antichrist kingdom it should come up among the 10 horns it should come up among the 10 horns where are the 10 horns the 10 horns are in europe you have to identify a country in europe is vatican city in europe very much it is in the heart of rome where is vatican city it is inside rome rome is the capital of italy but within vatican city this 110 acres this is a separate country it is among them and does this point suit very well with the vatican city yes it it does suit let's look at the other points the third one daniel 724 daniel 724 this verse says this horn will rise up after these 10 horns after them this horn will rise up after the 10 horns and in which year the 10 horns came up 476 ad 476 ad europe got broken down into 10 countries and when did the little horn vatican city or the previous name papacy we used to call it as papacy in the older days when did pope get his primacy so right now all the roman catholics are under the pope so when did he became the leader of the roman catholics it was in 538 ad there was a king called as emperor called as justinian there was an emperor a roman emperor called as king justinian and he gave the pope it's called as a papal primacy and if you want to understand these papal primacy there are plenty of uh, secular documents available and these secular documents let me take you through these points one by one the little horn rises after the 10 horns and the western roman empire the western part of europe the western roman empire it was completely broken overthrown by a king called as odoacer in this year 476 ad and the last caesar's name he is romulus augustus he was the last caesar and uh, he was captured by this king odoacer and with this the roman empire got abolished the western roman empire it came to an end in 476 ad 
and the western roman empire got divided into 10 different kingdoms and the papacy it came up after 476 ad did it come up after the 10 horns yes in which year in 538 ad there was a king called as king emperor or king justinian he was an emperor of the eastern roman empire there are two different roman empires remember that the great image it has two legs both the legs are iron one is the western roman empire the other one is the eastern roman empire there is a roman empire but it got divided into two different empires the western roman empire is one of the legs the eastern roman empire is the second leg and this is the end of the western roman empire and there was a decree called as a papal primacy if we go to this wikipedia website you'll be able to take a look at these are secular information we are not concocting any kind of false information here these are secular information papal primacy is a keyword we can go look for this keyword in any of the secular websites we'll know that uh, the pope got his primacy in this particular year 538 ad and this is when pope became the head of all churches in those days we didn't have the concept of protestant churches even the eastern orthodox church was not available during 538 ad the first schism within the body of christ it came up in 1054 the first division within the church it came up in 1054 1054 the eastern orthodox church it was called as the great schism it was called as the great schism and uh, these eastern orthodox churches they went out of the catholic church and then after 500 years in 1517 martin luther he broke up from the roman catholic church so we all talk about martin luther but that's not the only division even 500 years before martin luther he got separated from the catholic church there was a great schism called as uh, the uh, eastern eastern orthodox church this church is based out of uh, istanbul turkey's capital istanbul and they have lot of churches in greece and they also have their representation in russia so one is russia the other one is greece and the eastern european countries and these are the basis for the eastern orthodox church which initially got separated from the roman catholic church in 1054 and even the third point it fits very well with the pope and the roman catholic church let's look at the fourth points it says the little horn it plucks up three horns it plucks up three co- three horns in the sense it is defeating three different kingdoms on the instigation of the pope there is an emperor called as emperor justinian he defeated three different kingdoms let's look at the names of these three kingdoms on the instigation of the pope the emperor called as justinian he defeated these three kingdoms the herule ostrogoths and the vandals and we have a famous terminology vandalism isn't it how do we get this term vandalism vandalism we got it from this term vandals vandals are one group of uh, the european uh, tribes there are a lot of tribes even in india we call them as chera chola maurya there are plenty of tribes in india even in europe there are gothic tribes there are plenty of gothic tribes available and these are three popular tribes the heruli ostrogoths and the vandals and they were completely destroyed based on the instigation of the pope this emperor emperor justinian he destroyed these three groups so three different horns three different kingdoms plucked out of the roots let's move on to the next point he shall be different from the other horns the 11th horn the little horn he will be different from the other horns how is the pope different from the other people the other horns the pope is a king he is a king of vatican he is also a religious leader isn't he different yes how is vatican city different vatican city is a country it is also the headquarters of the roman catholic church it is a religio political system he is completely different from the rest of the horns if you look at other countries secular countries india usa or any other countries this is just political entities you have the head of uh, a particular government he is either called as a prime minister or a president he is just a political person but if you look at pope pope is a political leader he is the king of vatican he is the president of vatican he has got diplomatic immunity he is also a religious leader he decides thing it is just one man earlier we read this verse it says that there were eyes of man on this particular horn which means that uh, this horn will be led by a single man and even the fifth point it fits very well with the pope and the roman catholic church look at the throne in which he is sitting jesus is the king of kings isn't it jesus is lord of lords king of kings and it says that there is a man at head daniel 7 8 it says there is eyes of a man on this little horn eyes of man on this little horn and what about the pope pope is a man 
and uh, do we have an elders who are leading the catholic church no we don't have the concept of elders biblically speaking elders have to lead the church it is not a chief pastor it is just elders a group of elders minimum of 3 and uh, here it's just a single man let's look at some of the titles given to the pope the pope is called as episcopus episcoporum he is called as the overseer of overseers he is called the bishop of bishops he is called as the father of father who is the father of fathers it is our heavenly father he is the father of fathers and he takes all the titles given to jesus who is our chief shepherd chief bishop it is jesus christ 1 peter 5:4 1 peter 5:4 it says jesus is the chief shepherd and here pope himself he calls himself as the bishop of bishops and it is the man as the head and he also speaks blasphemy isn't it plenty of verses in bible and daniel itself there are at least three verses which says that this particular beast it speaks pompous words daniel 7 8 daniel 7 11 daniel 7 25 it says that this particular little horn it speaks pompous words what is the meaning of pompous words and uh, it is revealed in revelation revelation 13:5 and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies the pompous words are actually translated as blasphemies and that's what we see in revelation 13:5 and what about the pope and the roman catholic system are they speaking blasphemy are they doing blasphemy yes very much to forgive sins they say that we have the authority to forgive sins when jesus is forgiving the sins of uh, a sinner who was uh, sick of palsy while he was healing Jesus was healing this person he says son cheer up your sins are forgiven and people say that you're blaspheming Jesus was not blaspheming he is god of gods he is the king of kings he is the lord of lords Jesus was not blaspheming but to say that i can forgive everyone's sins that is blasphemy against god if any man says that i have the authority to forgive the sins of everyone it means that we are blaspheming against the god of heaven and the next one is claiming to be god claiming to be god jesus says in john 10:30 i and the father are one and in john 10:33 people say that you are blaspheming because you are equating yourself to god jesus was not blaspheming because jesus is nothing but the flesh version of the father god isn't it jesus is the father god if you read through isaiah 9:6 jesus is the father and if any man says that i am the vicar of christ he is blaspheming god the pope says that i am the vicar of christ vicar of christ antichrist we sometimes understand this terminology in the wrong way anti is not against if you look at the actual meaning of this word it is a substitute anti is not against it is actually nothing but vice so we call it as vice captain in certain sports isn't it there is a captain and if the captain gets injured who becomes the next captain it is a vice captain so what is the vice captain doing is he against the captain no he is not against the captain he is fulfilling the role of the captain so similarly antichrist he says that i am christ because jesus in matthew 24 he said many false pro- prophets and false christs will come up he is talking about two different groups false christs and false prophets and they'll come and say what they'll come and say i am christ these phrases are available in matthew 24 so these two things these two blasphemies are done by the roman catholic system and the chief person who is instigating this it is the pope even this point it fits very well and if you look at certain books which are written in the roman catholic system people who are trying to uncover expose this evil there is a book called as dignity and duties of the priest many of them were written by the roman catholics themselves satan is always a fool he always tries to expose himself there is a book called as dignity and duties of the priest there is an excerpt taken from this the priest holds the place of the savior himself when by saying ego te absolvo it's a latin term ego te absolvo it means that your sins are completely forgiven can a man forgive the sins of thousands of people not at all possible and they say that they have the power to do this and this book is written by a roman catholic himself and the next book satan the antichrist and the false prophet and within this book there is a heading called as the archbishop of venice it says the bishop of rome who is nothing but the pope the bishop of rome is not only the representative of god jesus but he is jesus christ himself what a blasphemy isn't it the next one the great encyclical encyclical letters of leo the 13th leo the 13th was one of the popes 
and he has written some encyclicals there is a chapter called as reunion and these are authentic links what i had given these are authentic links circular links wikipedia links some of them directly from the vatican website and uh, here it says that we hold upon this earth the place of god almighty who is god almighty revelation 18 jesus says i am god almighty isn't it so he says i am god almighty what a blasphemy so this beast blasphemes the god of heaven jesus and the only person who is blaspheming god here on earth is the pope let's look at the next point persecuting power it will kill the saints of jesus isn't it even in daniel he can also have a look at this in uh, revelation 12 revelation 13 the dragon as well as the first beast both of them they go behind the children of jesus they persecute the saints of jesus they kill them they overcome they overcome them daniel 7:21 I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them it is not just making war it is also prevailing them it is also overcoming them it's also killing them Daniel 7:25 it says he shall persecute the saints of the most high is persecuting the saints of the most high and what about the catholic church let's go read the last 2000 years history or just go search for this roman catholic inquisition If you search for this keyword inquisition you will find varieties of inquisitions the spanish inquisition even in india the goan inquisition in goa there was a roman catholic inquisition a few centuries back spanish inquisition 1492 if you read through those stories millions and millions of true christians bible believing true christians were killed by the roman catholic church and when did it all end it ended in 1798 when napoleon bonaparte he arrested the pope and the pope died in prison all these 1500 years of persecution and killing of the saints it only stopped and the approximate estimate is 50 million people that's 5 crores and i'm not including the first world war and the second world war the first world war second world war there is a book called as the secret history of jesuits jesuit order is a small order within the roman catholic church there is a small group of priests and this order is responsible for the first world war and even the second world war how many people were killed in these two world wars there were 60 lakh people 60 lakh people killed in the first world war and about 5 crore people killed in the second world war if i add that uh, number to this more than 10 crore people 100 million people got killed by the roman catholic system had any protestant church killed 100 million people yes they are deceivers the deceivers they are deceiving people by teaching the false uh, things from bible but uh, all the protestants are joining all the protestants i'm not talking about the people i'm talking about the pastors the protestant pastors they're joining hands with the pope right now as we speak they're joining hands with the pope in the name of ecumenism in the name of one body yes we are body of jesus but they're trying to join with the body of a harlot the harlot who is a harlot the harlot is the one who sells her body for money and what is the church doing right now they're selling the body of jesus for money isn't it that's why she is called as a harlot and now Uh, revelation chapter 17 and 18 and uh, even this roman catholic church by the instigation of the pope and we have authentic sources to say that they have killed millions and millions of people look at the apology of pope francis pope francis apologized said that we are so sorry we killed millions of people but please forgive us yes we need to forgive as children of jesus we need to forgive but what is true repentance true repentance means we have to turn from that particular act had they thrown out all these idols they have not thrown out the idols apology of pope francis it's there in the wikipedia site itself inquisition details look at this terrible story saint bartholomew's day massacre 1572 paris the heart of france 1 lakh people got killed just in 3 days huguenots there is a particular group called the huguenots these are nothing but the french protestants in those days protestants were bible believing christians bible obeying christians we can't talk about the protestants these days like that last 100 years the protestants they've completely gone astray and uh, the first 400 years it was actually good 1572 around hunt, uh, around 1 lakh protestants the french protestants huguenots they were gathering in paris for a particular marriage the marriage of a particular king and the roman catholic system under the instigation of the pope they sent out a big army they killed 1 lakh people just in 3 days and this happened in paris this is recorded in secular history you can go look for it medieval inquisition roman inquisition spanish inquisition 1492 the
there was a great inquisition in spain the millions and millions of non catholics got killed especially the jews and roman catholic church they have a big history of killing the jews over many centuries not just alone in second world war why do you think hitler is killing all these millions of jews does hitler have anything against the jews no nothing hitler was a pure roman catholic he was brought up in the roman catholic system and he was fed by the roman catholic system under the instigation of the german pope while hitler was killing the jews there was a german pope he didn't even condemn hitler even once you can go look for the the old newspapers he didn't even condemn the hitler hitler who, who was killing the jews even once no condemnation came from rome and all these inquisitions were done by the roman catholic church there was a particular group called as waldensians pure bible believing christians waldensians and albigenses albi is the name of a particular village in france and most of the people in that particular village they were called as albigenians they were bible believing christians and they were completely against the pope the waldensians albigenses they completely against the pope they said that we are going to go ahead with bible alone we are not going to obey the pope so what does the pope do he always sends an army kill everyone whether it is 5000 whether it is 10000 whether there are children pregnant women he doesn't care about anyone they simply kill 1500 years of brutal killing and that's why we call them as dark ages there is a particular period we call it as dark ages because there was brutal killing unfortunately people didn't have bible in the hands because the printed bible uh, which year the printing press was invented 1450 the gutenberg bible the most printed book in the world is the king james bible the king james bible the gutenberg bible it got printed the printing press was invented in 1450 only after that uh, we got the paper book that's why it's called as a little book in revelation revelation 10th chapter it's called as a little book because in olden days bible used to be big the big big manuscripts even matthew if you want to read it will be in a big manuscript and people can't afford to buy those big books it was very costly in the older days but in the last couple of hundred of years we've had plenty of bibles but the problem is reading them isn't it with the help of holy spirit and let's come back to this point the persecuting power is the roman catholic power i can prove it in variety of ways let's have a look at these pictures now this is called as a torture chair where is it there are three museums in europe there are three museums in europe it's called as torture museum and what do they have they have torture instruments these torture instruments were created by whom it was created by the roman catholic church why was it created it was created to torture the bible believing christians and kill them brutally and thousands and thousands of true bible believing christians were tortured and put to death and i had taken these images from those websites authentic the torture museum websites one is in prague one is in uh, amsterdam in fact one of my friends he is there in germany i asked him like if you have some time why don't you please visit this particular and here they'll roast just the foot alone they'll roast just the foot this is one more type of torture this is the skull cracker this is a skull cracker this is how our brothers and sisters got killed this is a torture saw this is to rip a person into two and this is the tongue cutter just to cut the tongue alone this is how the children of jesus got killed brutally in the older days it stopped only in the last 200 years and there is let's move on to the next one there is no other church which killed the true christians like the catholic church point number 9 he changes laws and times it is whose prerogative to change the laws and times it is the god of heaven jesus if you look at daniel 221 it says he changes the times and the seasons daniel says it is the god it is jesus who changes times and seasons and who has taken this authority at least artificially speaking who has taken this authority from jesus it is the pope daniel 7:25 it says that and he shall intend to change times and the law he'll change the times and the laws what is the law it is the 10 commandments what is the basics of the law it is the 10 commandments who removed the idol worship commandment from the roman catholic system it is the pope Do we have the second commandment the idol worship commandment in the roman catholic system no we don't look at this website it is a vatican website the first commandment 
they talk about exodus in the first column they talk about deuteronomy 10 commandments and the third column look at the gap here in the second commandment there is a gap and how brazen is it isn't it and what did he do to make up the the last one he broke this into two the last commandment do not take your neighbor's wife and the goods and house and etc is broken this commandment into two because you had to have a number 10 he has removed the second commandment what about times yes he has changed the laws what about times what is the name of the current calendar the current calendar is called as a gregorian calendar how did we get this name gregorian calendar because of pope gregory pope gregory you can look, take a look at this year 1582 he changed october 5th to october 15th 10 days got lost because they wanted to move on to the solar calendar it is always sun worship in roman catholic church everything will have a circle isn't it you see the pictures of jesus so called jesus not the true biblical jesus not the almighty jesus you see the pictures of jesus you'll see a sun kind of a glow you'll also have the sun rays eucharist it's always a circle so everything will be sun based activity gregorian calendar it's the solar calendar that's how we got this name even today this calendar is called as the gregorian calendar and who changed the times and the law it is the pope even the ninth point fits very well with the pope let's move on to the 10th point he'll be ruling for about 1260 years we had already read it in daniel 725 then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time what is the meaning of a time we can interpret it from daniel itself in daniel chapter 4 verses 23 and 32 here nebuchadnezzar is banished for about seven times seven seasons or seven times or seven years here this term seven times it's interpreted as seven years isn't it he went out of the kingdom he was living in the forest among the beasts and he was there for about seven years after that jesus healed him he came back he got his kingdom back and it talks about seven times in two verses look at this verse as well daniel 4 32 it talks about seven times what is the meaning of seven times it is seven years so if we apply the same rule here what is the meaning of a time a time means it's one year let's try to interpret this phrase time times and half a time if you have a look at this table time is interpreted as one year it is 12 months in bible it's always a lunar calendar it's not a solar calendar so we need to always go for 30 days in one month so which is interpreted as 360 days times it is two years 24 months 720 days half a time it is half an year six months it's 180 days add all the three you get 1260 days you have this number in so many places daniel 12 7 you have this number and revelation 13 5 you have the same number revelation 11th chapter revelation 13th chapter so you have this particular number in so many different places in bible specifically in the books of daniel and revelation he rules for about 1260 days what book is this it's a prophetic book it's an end time prophetic book it's not an ordinary day it's a prophetic day and prophetic day how should we interpret it a prophetic day is always equal to one year i can give you example after example verse after verse i found at least excuse me I at least found out 80 different verses which says that one year is one day. It's called as a day for a year principle. It's called as a day for a year principle. And let's look at, uh, let's read these two verses. Ezekiel 4 6. Let's please read this. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side, then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah for 40 days. I have laid on you a day for each year. It says, I have laid on you a day for each year. Let's read Numbers 14.34. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days for each day you shall bear your guilt for one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. It says, you spied for about 40 days, and I'm punishing you for about 40 years. It's a day for a year principle, not just two verses alone. Let's look at few more verses. 
Genesis 5, 5. Let's read these verses. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and then he died. It says days is equal to years. All the days that Adam lived is these many years. It says days are years. Let's look at Genesis 6, 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. His days shall be these many years. Days are years always in Bible. Prophetic days are always interpreted as one year. Let's look at Genesis 25, 7. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, a hundred three score and fifteen years. And I've taken this from the King James Bible for certain verses. You'll have to only look at the King James Bible or certain times you can look at the NKJV. It's called as the days of the years. The days of the years. He lived for these many years. Days, the prophetic days are always interpreted as one year. It is actually not 1,260 days. It is 1,260 years. And who persecuted the saints of Jesus for about 1,260 years? It exactly matches in the history. When did we get the papal primacy given by Emperor Justinian? It was 538 AD. And you can add 1,260 years to it. What year do we get? We get 1,798. What happened during this year? Pope lost his power. How did Pope lose his power? Because Napoleon Bonaparte came. The fact that we have democracy in various countries, in most of the countries we have democracy, it's because of this one man, Napoleon Bonaparte. All the monarchies were destroyed by this guy. Napoleon Bonaparte, he came up in France and he scorched entire Europe. He scorched, he killed almost all the monarchs except for the King of England. Except for the King of England who was a Bible-believing kingdom in those days. Except for the King of England because God was protecting the Kingdom of England. And except for the Kingdom of England, every other monarchy was abolished by this guy, including the Pope. He sent out an army and the, the general who was leading the army, it's called as uh, his name is General Berthia. And he marched into Rome on February 10th, 1798. Look at this date, February 10th, 1798. He arrested the Pope, he put him in prison and the Pope died the next year. And the Pope lost all his papal states. They had a group of land, it's called as papal states. Uh, and we, They have certain names called as Lombardy and others. Uh, there are certain papal states. He lost all the papal districts, all the papal states, all the revenue from the papal states got lost. And this year was the year of the Pope and uh, he was left with no power after this particular year. What happened in between these years? 1790, 1798 till 1929. There's one, 131 years. Pope was not having any power. He was just occupying this particular Vatican city portion. There's 110 acres. He was inside that place. He was not going any outside. No dominion, no power whatsoever. In 1929, February the 11th, it was February the 10th, he got arrested. In 1798, 1929, February the 11th, he got the power back. Antichrist says, I'm still in control. He could have signed this agreement any other day. The Lateran Treaty, he could have signed it any other day in the year. But Satan says, I still have my kingdom on earth. So right now the kingdom of heaven, it's spreading. And during the second coming of Jesus, it will completely be abolished. And 1260 years, no Protestant pastor killed these many number of Christians. It is the Roman Catholic Pope. He is the leader of the anti-Christian kingdom. And most of the Protestant pastors are these days uniting under his banner. And under the name of ecumenism, you can go read for ecumenism, Luther was the first guy to come out of the Roman Catholic Church. In 1517, Martin Luther came out of it. Again, Lutheran Church is the first church to go back to the, the Roman Catholic Church. In 1999, the Lutheran Church, they signed a joint declaration with the Roman Catholic Church, saying that we are uniting with you. Even Methodists, if any of you are going to Methodist Church, you can ask your pastors, Methodists, they had already united with the Roman Catholic Church. And you have a list, big list of Protestant churches who got united with uh, the Roman Catholic Church. You can look for this entity, the World Council of Churches. There was an organization called as the World Council of Churches. It got established in 1948, the same year in which Israel got its independence. 
1948 they established this organization the world council of churches and uh, the, under this world council of churches all the protestant churches are part of this world council of churches and they had already signed an agreement with the pope so pope is clearly the antichrist look at this picture he says i am the horn he is showing the horn symbol he says i am the little horn isn't it and it is not just the pope alone we can't exclude the protestant churches they are still part of the same body whichever protestant church if they have signed the ecumenical document they are still part of this anti christian kingdom under the leadership of pope it's a hand in glove fit isn't it the 10 points are exactly matching and we are not left with just 10 points alone we have scores and scores of other verses holy spirit has given us the understanding and the revelation and we'll be looking at the other chapters very soon the papacy this is the right terminology to use vatican city is the name that we have right now that's why the exact names are not mentioned in bible because what if they had mentioned vatican city in bible people 200 years before they couldn't interpret vatican city so what if they call it as uh, let's say papacy right now no one uses this particular name so right now it's called as vatican city so god always uses poetic forms isn't it jesus always spoke in parables sometimes he was not speaking directly he spoke in parables because it's he said that uh, whoever has more will be given to him and whoever does not have and even whatever he has it will be taken out from him it is given to you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom whoever asks jesus whoever is humble jesus will reveal his deep and secret things so pope is the antichrist uh, as per the verses we had discussed and with this we can move on to the next one before we do that jesus is so kind and he is very very nice to the catholics isn't it if you look at revelation 18:4 he says come out of her my people he calls people out of babylon what is babylon and that's our next topic babylon is the roman catholic church and the ecumenical protestant churches not just the roman catholic church babylon is the roman catholic church and the ecumenical protestant churches jesus is kindly calling these people out of this babylon come out of her my people and you will find a same reference verse second corinthians 6 chapter verses 16 and 17 second corinthians 6 chapter verses 16 and 17 the 17th verse says come out and be separate come out and be separate you don't have to unite with the harlot's body you need to be united with the, the body of jesus not the harlot's body and if anyone who is watching this video if you are a catholic if you are an ecumenical protestant we need to understand the truth so jesus exhorts come out of her we need to come out of the false churches and be separate and be united with the true children of the bible believing children the obeying children of jesus so with this we complete our first topic we can move on to the next one